you know, you guys should elect an engineer president. You know, that's that's what Chinese do. The Chinese, you know, all our political leaders are lawyers, and all of China's political leaders are engineers. <laughs> so, oh gosh, we're going broke. We're mired in debt. We don't have as many scientists as we want or need, and jobs are going overseas. I assert that these are not isolated problems; that they're the collective consequence of the absence of ambition that consumes you when you stop having dreams. If all you do is coast, eventually you slow down, while others catch up and pass you by. Why nuclear energy, especially after what happened in Japan, and why? Melting salt reactor, and why thorium, and last but not the least, why China is the first one to eat the crap? That's Chinese saying. Uh, the Chinese Academy of Sciences has begun an effort to develop what they call TMSR, thorium molten salt reactor, and it's really along these same lines. And they are well funded and well staffed. 300 people working full time on it. They know that those are the same people who are going to turn around and operate and maintain those reactors. I give them great credit. It's very compelling work. Um, Chinese are definitely in the lead right now on this. 1994, the state of California passed the law of the zero emissions. And GM's EV1 came out in 1996 because they want very much like to catch the market of the California. The big oils heavily lobbying East Coast not to follow the same track as California did. Finally, GM called back all the EV1s from the market and crashed them in 2004. It's, 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 it's something to me like, like, like World War II, NAS. It's amazing, it's, it's a very scary story here. Here is pure electrical car developed by Chinese academic sciences. We used to have a dream, if we can produce a clean electricity, then we can drive our electrical car. However, if you look at this, as of today, it, it's all gasoline cars. So it makes our job even impossible. We need a revolutionary something happen. The white thorium. And why MSR? Low pressure here, which give you more safety. We also end up with the high temperature here. We need high temperature. Because if you can go 900 degrees C, then we can use this energy to convert the CO2, which is not the waste at all, is a, is a raw material for our chemicals. In fact, we need the energy to convert them, but we need the high temperature. There's all sorts of very, very interesting chemistry that we have actually never even been able to have the opportunity to look at because we've never had a cheap energy platform at those temperatures. With a heat platform like, like a, a molten salt reactor, you can do any number of high temperature reactions. We're still going to need liquid fuels for vehicles and machinery, but we could generate these liquid fuels from the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and from water, much like nature does. We could generate hydrogen by splitting water and combining it with carbon harvested from CO2 in the atmosphere, making fuels like methanol, ammonia, and dimethyl ether, which could be a direct replacement for diesel fuels. The whole planet's transportation system is gauged toward the consumption of a fossil fuel. There's an entire internal combustion infrastructure on the planet. Imagine carbon neutral gasoline and diesel, sustainable, and self-produced. A way of getting the full life cycle out of the infrastructure we've already built up. Because you don't want to just abandon the infrastructure we've already built up. We have trillions of dollars of internal combustion engine machinery around, but we need to at least stop putting more stuff in the air. The opportunities abound. I, I, I couldn't even tell you. I could, I, I just, there's, there's so many possibilities. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even want to predict. Wouldn't even want to. 
All right, so this is the work that's actually going on at NRL today. This is not a theoretical possibility. The ocean, or rivers as it's pointed out, is full of carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Um, there's lots of this everywhere on the planet. In fact, seven-tenths of the Earth's surface is covered with water. We were looking at here at the electro electrolytic cation exchange module. This is on version three. Here's the skid that's used down at Naval, uh, Naval Air Station Key West. And what's going on is pretty simple. We're pumping electricity into this, this module up here. We're pulling carbonic acid, HCO3, out of the water. And by the way, per unit gallon, we're getting about a 92% removal from it. And then we're using standard electrolysis to crack water in order to make hydrogen. And what do you do with it? You string the carbon together with your hydrogen and let's get into the fuels business. Here is the spectrum for JP5, which is the standard fuel used to run all the aircraft, a bit like a classic bell curve. And what you're seeing is the spectrum based upon carbon content of the individual hydrocarbons as you make this guy out of oil. So this is, this is anybody, Exxon, BP, Shell, whoever you wanna name it, pulling petroleum out of the ground, fractionally distilling it, and making JP5 according to the mill spec. So what happens coming out of our machine down at Naval Air Station Key West? Well now look at this, we've got a decay curve. Because we're manufacturing the fuel synthetically, we're able to control the carbon content and get a better concentration of the C10 hydrocarbons that we want than you can get from natural oil. So what this turns out is that the synthetically made aviation fuel actually has a higher energy density and is cleaner. It doesn't have the sulfur compounds in it, it doesn't have the nitrates in it. All of the other really nasty stuff that comes out of burning a fossil fuel we don't have and we have a better power density profile, making this stuff artificial. If, if you do just basic high school chemistry, if we can get hydrogen and CO2 from seawater, you have the fundamental building blocks right there for making any hydrocarbon fuel you want. Burn the fuel, it'll go into the air, it'll get absorbed in the ocean, pulled out of the ocean, turned into the fuel, burned and back into the air. So you, your car works beautifully just as today, but it's not running on oil, but it's still running the same fuel you have today. It's not a real airplane, I admit it. However, you're looking at it in the air, flying, on fuel that was made from seawater and electricity. What do you do about civilian aviation? Are we gonna to move to a world where only the highest of our elected officials fly around the world and the rest of us get to walk? Because there is no substitute for aviation fuel if you wanna get in the air. We're not gonna have solar powered aircraft, we're not gonna have hydrogen fuel powered aircraft anytime soon. We're looking at some total radical technology breakthrough if you wanna fly. The hydrocarbic acid in the ocean is in equilibrium with the CO2 in the atmosphere. It's a very simple test. Seal up a fish tank, fill salt water in the bottom, don't let any air into it. Run your probes in there, pull carbonic acid out of the bottom, read your CO2 level in the air above it, and watch the CO2 level in the atmosphere drop. Every time you take a piece of carbon out of the ocean, it is the same as taking it out of the atmosphere. It will pass from the air into the water. So when you send an aircraft up in the air and it's running on fuel you made by taking carbonic acid out of the ocean, you have a virtual carbon cycle. You are not adding CO2 at all. It's carbon free fuel that is carbon and burns in our existing engines.